Welcome back. And now it's time for curves. In this lecture, we'll be looking at the final two of our six basic types of structural elements, both of which are curved members, the cable and the arch. When you look at the majestic curve of the St. Louis Gateway Arch and the graceful sweep of the main cables of the Golden Gate Bridge, has it ever occurred to you that their principal structural elements the cable and the arch have exactly the same shape? If so, did you ever wonder if there's an underlying scientific reason why the designers of these structures chose the same shape? In this lecture, we'll explore the mechanics of the cable and the arch, and we'll determine the extensive and occasionally surprising parallels between them. First, cables. There are two basic cable configurations we'll consider in this lecture, and both are illustrated here. The first is a cable that supports a uniform load distributed all along the cable's length. The second is a cable that supports a horizontally distributed load that's suspended below it. Now these two configurations might seem like essentially the same thing, but they aren't. As the diagram shows, there's a subtle difference in the two loading configurations, and this causes a subtle difference in the mechanics of the two cables. While we're here, some terminology please. The horizontal distance from support to support is called the span of a cable. The vertical distance from the supports down to the lowest point in the cable is called the sag. And when I refer to the length of a cable, I'm actually talking about this curved distance. Think of it as the amount of cable that you'd need to buy at your local hardware store to reach from support to support with the appropriate amount of sag. The cable's length is always somewhat greater than its span. Now, if we suspend a cable from its, uh, by its ends from two points of equal height, like this, it naturally falls into this beautiful curved shape. Note that the only load acting on this cable is its own weight. And the self-weight is, in fact, uniformly distributed along the cable's length. So this is the first of our two categories. And by the way, for this demonstration, I'm using a chain rather than a cable because the chain has a lot of mass and because it's very flexible. So it, it drapes very nicely and, and therefore it, it illustrates that characteristic shape of a cable uh, particularly well and in a way that you can see it more clearly. But from the theoretical perspective of engineering mechanics, there's actually no difference between a chain and a cable. Now, note that a draped cable carries load entirely in tension. We can tell because a cable simply won't carry compression. As I always tell my students when we're working on cable problems, you can't push a rope. Our first category, a cable supporting a uniform load distributed along its length, is the oldest form of cable structure. There's good evidence that simple suspension bridges like this were being built in China as early as the third century BC. Initially, the cables were made of cane or bamboo, but archaeologists have found a stone tablet describing an iron chain bridge built in the first year of the Han Dynasty, 206 BC. The structure shown here is a relatively modern bridge in China's Henan province, but it's still quite representative of the traditional Chinese suspension bridge type. Note that the bridge deck is attached directly to the cables, which means that the principal load is in fact uniformly distributed along the length of the cable rather than suspended below it. A cable loaded along its own length naturally assumes a curved shape called a catenary. This can be proved mathematically and in that mathematical proof what we find is that the shape of the cable is actually a mathematical function called a hyperbolic cosine. The catenary looks very much like a parabola however mathematically it is quite different and we'll talk about that difference shortly. Anyway, a draped cable naturally assumes this characteristic geometric shape without any assistance from us. Now, as you can see here, the cables of the Chinese bridge have very little sag. You think there's a relationship between the amount of sag and the tension in the cable? Well, in a moment, we'll look at that question mathematically. 
But I'll bet if you think about it, you can already guess the answer right now. Our second category of cable is the type that supports a horizontally distributed load suspended below the cable. We can model this configuration, and in fact, I've modeled it here with this physical model. And notice that the load on the cable now is not the cable itself. In fact, for this configuration, we're going to assume that the weight of the cable is very, very small in comparison with the loads that are suspended from it. The load on the cable consists of a series of equal weights which are equally spaced along a horizontal plane below the cable. This configuration is more representative of a typical modern suspension bridge, such as the Bear Mountain Bridge, shown here, because the principal loading is not the curved cable itself, but rather the horizontal bridge deck that's suspended below the cable. The Bear Mountain Bridge crosses the Hudson River just a few miles south of my home at West Point. In 1924, when it was completed, this was the longest suspension span in the world. I like to use this bridge to illustrate basic principles of cables because, as you can see in the photo, only the center span of the bridge is actually suspended from the main cables. Those short outer spans aren't connected to the cables at all. Thus, this real-world bridge is essentially the same as my physical model and the analytical model that we're about to develop. To learn about cables, let's again turn to that all-important principle of equilibrium. If a body is at rest, then all the forces and moments acting on that body must be in balance. We can use this principle to, sh to determine both the shape of the cable and its internal tension force. Let's begin by drawing a free body diagram of the main cable with its external loads and reactions. Its geometry is defined by its span and its sag, as shown here. It has a uniformly horizontally distributed load and remember, that's the type of load that we would express in terms of pounds per foot, force per length. It's distributed along the entire length of the bridge deck. The weight of the cable itself is assumed to be very small, negligible in comparison with the load hanging from it in this analysis. The cable also needs to have both vertical and horizontal reactions, as you can see in the free body diagram. And as you can see in my model, the vertical reactions are there to hold the cable up, and the horizontal reactions are there to prevent it from pulling inward under the action of that load. Now, to investigate the internal force in the cable, we need to do what we always do to investigate internal forces, make a conceptual cut through the cable to expose those internal forces. The middle of the span is a particularly convenient location for making this cut because the cable is perfectly horizontal at that point and therefore the internal tension force must also be perfectly horizontal. Now, we can draw a free body diagram of half the cable showing the internal tension at the cut and we can also see that we now have three unknown forces two reactions, the horizontal and vertical, out at the end of the cable, and of course that internal unknown cable tension force. We also have three equations of equilibrium available to us, and so it's a straightforward process now to write the equations and solve, just as we did back in lecture two. I'll spare you the details and go directly to the solution. Here it is. By the way, as we look at the solution, note that all of the dimensions and loads on our free body diagram are symbols rather than numbers. So the solution to the equilibrium problem is also expressed entirely in symbols. And this is really helpful because it allows us to draw generalized conclusions about how cables work rather than just looking at a numerical solution. And as you can see, the solution itself consists of three equations, each one of which results directly from the solution of a corresponding equilibrium condition. Each of these equations has something important to tell us. First, the horizontal reaction H is equal to the cable tension T. So the greater the tension, the greater the outward pull needed to hold the cable in place. Second, the vertical reaction is equal to half of the total weight of the, of the cable or the total weight applied to the cable. In a suspension bridge, the cable transmits this same force downward into the towers. Thus what we can see from this equation is that the greater the load and the longer the span, the greater the downward force that's applied to the towers. And third, the cable tension is proportional to the load and inversely proportional to the sag. That means that if we hold the sag constant, a larger load causes larger cable tension. 
If we hold the load constant, then a larger tension results in less cable sag. Now that latter point is particularly important, so I'd like to verify it with a simple experiment. As you can see, my cable is, is firmly fixed up here on this side, but on the opposite side, the cable actually runs over a pulley, and from that pulley is suspended a set of weights. So this end of the cable is actually not firmly anchored, it's completely free to rotate, and the only thing that's holding in its present shape is that I've carefully selected the amount of weight hanging from the cable such that the whole system remains in equilibrium. It's actually free to move. Um, and of course, the amount of weight I've selected is in fact the cable tension because the cable simply runs over the top of this pulley, which is free to rotate. So what would happen if I increased the amount of cable tension by hanging some additional weight from this end of the cable? Well, let's give it a try and, and see. The mathematical equation tells us that if we increase the tension, the sag should change. And I think you know which way it's going to go. When I apply additional force, thereby increasing the cable tension, notice that the system seeks a new equilibrium condition, and the new equilibrium condition with the existing loads is one in which the amount of sag has been substantially reduced. So there we say very, there we see very clearly the physical relationship between cable tension and cable sag. So what are the implications for this phenomenon for real cable structures? Well, in general, it's advantageous to minimize the cable tension. A smaller tension force requires a cable of smaller diameter, which results in lower cost. And so increasing the cable sag would generally result in a less expensive cable. But there's a practical limit to this potential cost saving. On a suspension bridge, the height of the towers above the deck must be at least equal to the cable sag. Otherwise, the bottom of the cable would fall below the bridge deck. So greater sag also requires taller towers. And of course, taller towers are more expensive. So there's a trade-off here. Increasing the sag reduces the cable cost, but increases the tower cost. The engineer's challenge, as always, is finding the right balance between these two competing alternatives. We can actually see this trade-off playing out in historical development of suspension bridges, with older bridges like this one using relatively short stone towers and low cable sag, whereas newer structures tend to use much taller steel towers and significantly greater sag. We'll study these developments further in Lecture 15. Now notice how one simple equilibrium analysis has produced so many rich insights about the way cables behave. And we're not done yet. If we make our conceptual cut somewhere other than at mid-span on the cable, and we repeat that same equilibrium analysis, an even more powerful conclusion emerges. The shape of the cable with that horizontally distributed load suspended beneath it is not a catenary, but rather, mathematically speaking, a parabola. And this brings us to a particularly unique aspect of cable behavior. The shape of a cable always depends on its loading. In other words, the cable assumes the shape that's necessary to maintain equilibrium with its applied loads. So for example, if on this cable I apply a concentrated load rather than a uniformly distributed load, what we see is that the cable changes shape drastically in order to create a new equilibrium condition with this new loading condition. Similarly, if I could somehow instantaneously cut all of these little suspender cables so that the uniformly distributed load dropped away instantly and all that was left was the self-weight of the cable, what we would see was that the shape of the cable would instantaneously change from the parabola, which is associated with the uniform loading, to a catenary, which is associated with the loading that's applied along the, le the length of the cable. But if I did that, you'd still have to take my word for it, because the difference between a parabola and a catenary is extremely small. This graph shows precise plots of both curves using exactly the same span and sag. The two lines are so close together we can barely distinguish them. Furthermore, no suspension bridge cable is really, in practice, either a perfect parabola or a perfect catenary, because it carries both its own weight, which causes it to tend toward the catenary, 
at the same time as it's carrying the weight of the horizontal deck, which tends toward the shape of a parabola. So the shape of a suspension bridge cable actually falls somewhere between those two lines, the catenary and the parabola, and the fact that they're so close together means that uh, the distinction between the two is really uh, extremely minor. For simplicity then, I'm simply going to refer to this shape as parabolic. When I do, remember that I'll actually be referring to something ever so slightly different from a parabola, but certainly close enough for our purposes. Onward to arches. You know, in many ways, an arch is the exact opposite of a cable. And now that we know something about cables, we should be able to look at arches in a new way. Let's begin our study by building a semicircular arch of the sort that the Romans would use in this bridge, the Pont Saint Martin, located in northern Italy. You might not have guessed it, but the 103 foot span of this arch is believed to be the longest span that has actually survived from antiquity. Let's go ahead and build a model of the Pont Saint Martin. One of the most fundamental characteristics of an arch is that it isn't self-supporting until it's completely constructed. And so when the Romans built an arch like this, they would have started by constructing a temporary support structure called a centering, which is designed to form the shape of the arch. Once the centering is in place, the arch then is constructed of individual wedge-shaped stones called voussoirs. We would install those stones on both sides of the bridge and then add successive voussoirs up the side of the centering. In each case, bringing the arch a little bit higher until we finally reach the center. And we have one space remaining. That last voussoir is often called the keystone of the arch. And once the keystone is in place, the arch is capable of supporting itself. So we can now, at this point, remove the centering. And the arch now stands on its own. And indeed, it's not just capable of carrying its own load it actually is capable of carrying significant compression force as well. So, this arch has two essential structural characteristics. First, it carries load entirely in compression. We can see that very clearly because, as you'll recall, the individual pieces of the arch aren't connected together in any way. There was no glue or mortar that held them together. The only thing holding them together is gravity. So, for example, if we had an arch and we somehow found a way to apply tension to it, well, we would see very easily that it's physically incapable of carrying tension. The blocks would simply fall apart. There's nothing holding them together. So arches hold, uh, carry load entirely in compression. This characteristic accounts for the use of arches in many of the ancient world's greatest structures, structures like the Pont Saint Martin. The principal structural materials available to ancient builders were stone, brick, concrete, and wood. Wood lacked permanence and was scarce in many regions of the ancient world. And those other materials, masonry and concrete, are strong in compression but weak in tension. Thus the arch was particularly well suited to the materials available in antiquity. In our lecture on beams, we saw that the architrave of the Greek temple of Artemis approached the upper limit of possibility for stone beams. And these 28-foot spans would have required extremely high-quality stone because even a small flaw subjected to tension on the bottom surface of the beam might easily trigger a catastrophic fracture. But an arch can easily span four times that distance with any number of small stones or bricks, as we see at the Pont Saint Martin. And the quality of the material is considerably less important in an arch because even relatively large flaws don't necessarily reduce the stone's ability to carry compression. For these reasons, the arch was made to order for the grand ambitions of the Romans who exploited this structural form in so many fascinating ways that will require a full lecture to talk about them. That first essential characteristic of an arch is that it carries load entirely in compression. The second is that an arch requires both vertical and horizontal reactions to carry load. On our model, the vertical reactions are provided by the base, the wooden base, which supports the arch from below. The horizontal reactions are provided by these two wooden blocks on the outsides, which support the arch from the side. Under load, an arch tends to flatten. And when it does, 
the ends of the arch out here at the base tend to move outward. That outward tendency is called thrust, and thrust must be resisted by some sort of physical support. So, if an arch requires that physical lateral support in order to stand up and carry load, then presumably removing one of these two wooden blocks should cause it to collapse. Well, let's test that theory and see how it works. If I remove this block out here, and then release the arch, we see <laughs> it's still standing, but if I apply just the slightest bit of load, we see that it falls over. So, what just happened here? As always, the principle of equilibrium will provide some useful insights for us to enhance our understanding. Let's draw a free body diagram of the arch and apply the principle exactly as we did with the cable. Start with a free body diagram of the entire element. And then we make a cut at mid-span and isolate half of the element. In this case, as we draw our free body diagram of half the arch and expose that internal force, we note that the internal force must be compressive rather than tensile. So the horizontal reaction, H, now is directed inward to maintain equilibrium rather than outward as it was with a cable. This reaction resists the thrust of the arch and it prevents that collapse that you just saw in my structural model. Now, when we solve the equilibrium equations, here's the answer we get. Exactly the same as the results we got for the cable, except now we're calculating compressive force in the arch rather than tension in the cable. Now, for the purpose of this course, the most important conclusion we should take away from these results is that the horizontal thrust of an arch is inversely proportional to its height. You can see that in the third equation. A taller arch produces less thrust than a flatter arch. This relationship will be critically important when we compare semicircular Roman arches with the pointed Gothic arches of the medieval era later on in lecture 12. Wow! We're seeing some amazing parallels between arches and cables here. A cable carries load entirely in tension. An arch carries load entirely in compression. A tension on a cable pulls inward on its supports and thrust from an arch pushes outward. A cable and an arch both require both vertical and horizontal reactions to carry load. For the cable, the horizontal reactions are oriented outward. For an arch, those horizontal reactions are oriented inward to contain the thrust. In both cable and arch, the horizontal reactions are inversely proportional to the height. Increasing the sag of the cable decreases tension and horizontal reaction. Increasing the height of the arch decreases its lateral thrust and its horizontal reaction. But what about shape? If the natural shape of a cable is parabolic, why are all Roman arches semicircular? Well, it turns out the Romans were tremendously capable as practicing engineers, but they didn't have the analytical methods necessary to discover that a semicircle is really not the optimal shape for an arch. It wasn't until the 1600s that our old friend Robert Hooke applied the newly formulated principle of equilibrium to, ter to determine the ideal shape for an arch. His conclusion, if the arch supports only its own weight, its ideal shape is a catenary, and if it supports a horizontally distributed load, its ideal shape is, you guessed it, a parabola. Hooke's theorem, written originally in Latin, is almost poetic. Ut pendit continuum flexile, sic stabit contiguum rigidum inversum. As hangs the flexible line, so but inverted stands the rigid arch. At the time, Hooke was working with Christopher Wren on the design of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And on Hooke's advice, Wren actually incorporated this principle into his ingenious design of the great dome over St. Paul's. It might not look parabolic in this picture, but trust me, there is a parabola hiding deep inside. We'll examine this structure in Lecture 21. Now at this point, it shouldn't surprise you to learn that architect Eros Serenin designed the St. Louis Gateway Arch as a perfect catenary curve. And this made perfect sense because this arch has to carry only its own self-weight distributed along the length of the arch. But before we give Hook or Serene and too much credit, we must consider one of the most amazing structures that has survived from late antiquity, the vaulted throne room of the Persian Imperial Palace at Ctesiphon, located in modern-day Iraq.
This magnificent arched vault, which spans 82 feet and is over 110 feet tall, is a near-perfect parabola. It was probably built around the year 540 AD, over a thousand years before Robert Hooke made his discovery of the optimal shape of an arch. The structure is even more astonishing when we realize that it's made of the most fragile of ancient building materials, mud brick, and was constructed without the use of any centering. We can only conclude that this arch is standing today because of its structurally perfect shape. So, if the Roman semicircular arch wasn't optimal, then why have so many of them survived from antiquity? This question is best answered through the use of a mechanics concept called the thrust line. The thrust line is a graphical representation of the path that internal compression takes through an arch, or any other element that's subjected to compressive loading for that matter. To determine where the thrust line falls within an arch, we need to make a series of cuts along the length of the arch and then solve the equations of equilibrium to determine the location of that internal compressive force. Then we string them all together and plot them as if it's a graph. This analysis for an arch shows us that the thrust line for an arch is parabolic, as long as the, the loading is uniform, regardless of the shape of the arch. And so, even for a semicircular Roman arch, the thrust line is a parabola. But as long as the parabolic thrust line remains entirely within the boundaries of the arch, the arch remains stable. At any location where the thrust line is off-center, there's actually a little bit of bending occurring in addition to the internal compression force. But as long as the thrust line is physically inside the boundaries of the arch, that bending isn't large enough to cause problems. And what happens if any portion of that thrust line falls outside the boundaries of the arch, as you see here? Well, when this happens, the bending stress gets so large that it causes the joints between the voussoirs to open up. At that point, the arch becomes unstable and it collapses. And so returning to our original question, Roman semicircular arches have survived from antiquity because they're thick enough to completely contain that parabolic thrust line, as you can see here. And one reason why pointed Gothic arches are often so much thinner than semicircular Roman arches is because the parabolic thrust line fits much more comfortably within that pointed arch shape. A really fascinating variation on this concept is a particular type of structural element called a jack arch, which is shown here. This is the lintel over one of the windows of my own house, which was built in 1908. But you can find nearly identical examples in ancient Roman ruins. It sure doesn't look like an arch. It looks much more like a beam. But those angled ends and the wedge-shaped bricks cause it to function exactly as an arch. The key is that the thrust line is contained entirely within the member, so it remains stable under load. The arch and the cable. In a sense, they're two sides of the same coin, as we've seen today. And no one had a better appreciation for this relationship than the Catalan architect Antoni Gaudi. And nowhere is that understanding more evident than in his masterwork, La Sagrada Familia Church in Barcelona. To design this church, Gaudi drew a one-tenth scale floor plan, and he attached it to a board, which was then mounted on the ceiling of his workshop. His setup has been preserved, as you can see here, and what you're looking at, it's pretty hard to discern, but what you're looking at is actually a model of Sagrada Familia upside down. The way he built it was to attach cords to the plan of the building, again, mounted on this board upside down on the ceiling of his workshop, and the points of attachment were the places where the columns would be located in the actual structure. These cords were then draped from column location to column location to form inverted arches. And then in some cases, Gaudi actually attached small sacks of lead to the cords, you can see them there in the photo, to adjust their shape. In much the same way that my application of a concentrated load on my cable model distorted the shape of the cable. And then finally, he took photos of this incredible assemblage, turned them upside down, and then used them as the basis for his design of the building. Now, knowing Gaudi's method, we can't help but look at this incredible structure, La Sagrada Familia, but in a fresh new way. 
We now know that these columns, arches, and spires are actually cables frozen in stone and turned upside down, giving this extraordinary structure a natural form that's unique in all the world. La Sagrada Familia has been under construction since 1882, and it's actually not expected to be completed until 2026. You can actually see some scaffolding in this video right here. Before Gaudi died in 1926, he was asked about the slow pace of construction. A devout Catholic, he responded, my client is not in a hurry. Gaudi understood the value of patience in the pursuit of a worthwhile goal. I hope you also recognize the value we've gained from patiently studying the principles of engineering mechanics over the past eight lectures. Like Gaudi, we've looked to the fundamentals. Basic scientific principles apply to basic structural elements, tension members, columns, beams, trusses, cables, and arches. Each of these elements con contributes uniquely to the splendor and diversity of the world's great structures. Next lecture, we'll look at challenges faced by structural systems as a whole, and we'll learn to follow the flow of forces through an entire structure. Until then, thank you.